Praise God. I'd like to share from um, a passage of scripture that first came to me in a new way when Graham Davis um, was speaking, and that scripture came up in person. And a few weeks later, when I was speaking, I hadn't planned for that scripture to, it wasn't part of the plan I had in mind when I started, but in the course of this, um, speaking, that came up as well. And that got me thinking about it. And then when something grabs hold of you and doesn't let go, I so thought, thought about it, the overwhelming thought was how tragic that passage of scripture is in what it says. And that scripture is in Matthew um, chapter 7, primarily verses 21 to 23. Like I said, it just struck me how, how immensely tragic that is. <coughs> Reading from the New King James, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you will practice lawlessness. If you think about that, it's, it's, it's tragic in so many ways. Firstly, this is not a parable. If it was a parable, it would say he spoke a parable to them. Or Jesus would say the kingdom of God is likened unto. Now here, from the context, from the construction, it's clear he's making a prophetic statement of what will be, not what may happen, not what could be prevented if X was done, he's just speaking prophetically in that there, this will happen. That's one. Secondly, he says many are involved as opposed to a few. Now, how many are many? I don't know. But he says many. Number three, it's quite clear that these many people, when they say, did we not or have we not done X, Y, Z in your name, they are not lying. I know they are not lying because a great English poet, Matthew Arnold, whom I read in school, in one of his poems there is this line that says, truth sits upon the lips of dying men. Truth sits upon the lips of dying men. What you have here is beyond dying. You're talking about a people standing before the Lord, standing before he who knows all things, who sees right through them. Even a man or a woman who all his life on earth told a lie with every utterance. At this stage, they cannot lie cannot lie standing before the Lord. And I know they're not lying also because Jesus does not dispute their claim. He doesn't say to them, that's a lie. You never did any of those. He simply said, go away. I never knew you. Because you walked in iniquity, you practiced lawlessness. So this is Hugely tragic because we are referring to people considered fellow Christian brothers and sisters across the generations of the Christian era, Christian age. It could be people today. And so that just got me seeking to understand 
what is this thing that is, to put it starkly, that is so irredeemably disqualifying? Because that's what it is. There is something that is irredeemably, decisively disqualifying. And to use the word irredeemable in the context of the Lord, that's quite serious because we know that the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews 10 says, in the blood of bulls and of goats was sufficient to sanctify the flesh. How much more will the blood of Jesus purge your conscience from every evil work that you might serve the living God? So these people are in this position not for anything Jesus failed to do. Rather, there is a nature within, there is a disposition within, deep within the soul that would not submit to the cleansing work of the blood of Jesus. And I sought to understand, Lord, what is this? Because it could be me. It could be somebody I know. What is this that I might put it before you that you might deal with it, that I don't be not counted among these many. And sometimes when you seek um, insight into scripture, I have found in my experience that the, the greatest explainer of scripture is actually scripture itself, the most reliable. Because, yes, there may be 66 books in the Bible written by a diverse range of people across centuries. But in truth, there is just but one author. It is one word. And so quite often, if you seek God earnestly to shed light on a passage of scripture, he, what he does is to illuminate another scripture. And in the light of that illumination, the face of that illumination, you gain understanding to the scripture you, 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 you seek understanding on. And so as I thought about this, I believe the Lord brought to my remembrance another scripture in the Old Testament that is almost a perfect type of what is described in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It's of a man who did mighty deeds in Israel, accomplished huge miracles, if you like, but in the end, his Lord said of him, I never knew him. He walked lawlessness. And I'm talking about none other than, you may have guessed it, Joab. He's a man who is hardly mentioned in, in you know, David, there is talk of David, and Joab is barely mentioned, but his life, his experience is almost a perfect shadow of what Jesus talks about in Matthew 7. And as I looked deeper into that, I saw something there. I'm not saying it is the lawlessness that Jesus talked about, but it is. It, is, it has something to do with it. It is close to it in, 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 its, in its application and implication. So let's look at Joab's life and see what we can learn from that in, in the context of Matthew 7. I said Joab performed spectacular deeds in Israel. Natural Israel, we would all agree, came closest to the nation that God intended under the reign of David. Even today, the star on the, on the Israel, on Israel's flag is the star of David because David represents the, 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 the zenith of geopolitical Israel. They, they conquered, David conquered all, all the territory almost that God assigned to them and subdued all surrounding nations. 
Some might say Solomon's reign was greater, but Solomon simply lived off the accomplishments that David handed over to him. But from Solomon, they would go downhill. But under David, Israel attained its a powerful position. And right with David, across every step of the way, was Joab. But Joab was at the heart of everything David accomplished. He was the commander of the armies of Israel for 40 years that David was king. And before that, Joab was right there with him. Whatever he accomplished, Joab was right at the front. But let's look at 1 Kings chapter 2, David's verdict concerning Joab when it really, really mattered. And this is no less tragic for how it ended for this great man who accomplished so much in the name of his Lord and by extension in the name of the Lord. When he came to it, this is the verdict of his king, of his Lord, and by extension, the verdict of the Lord. When the end came and David was dictating his last will and testament, he exhorted Solomon, be strong in the Lord, obey all his commands. And then when he came to specifics, the very first person he mentioned was Joab, just to emphasize how uppermost this thought was in his heart. First Kings 2 from verse 5. So moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jetha, whom he killed, and he shed the blood of war in peacetime, and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist, and on his sandals that were on his feet. Therefore do according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. We know how it ends for Job. But this is sad. And I wanted to understand what again, what did Job do that was irredeemable? Was it murder? Yes, on the face of it, he murdered two men, but he could not just be murder because if it was murder David was a murderer he killed Uriah in cold blood now it has to be more than that there was something within Joab there was a disposition within him there was a nature deep within his soul that was so disqualified And that, that has something to do with Matthew 7. And the thought that came to me as I thought about this was this. It came down to this. Joab, all the 40 years plus, he worked with David. He was beside David. He accomplished mighty things in the name of David and in the name of God. In truth, Joab at no point, Joab would never, never deny himself for his king. Joab, in the midst of everything he did, in truth, Joab loved Joab much more than he loved David. Joab cared for Joab. Joab would never deny himself. To the extent that Joab cared for David, to the extent that Joab loved David, it was only to the extent that that care for David, that love for David also enhanced, also secured, also advanced Joab's interest. 
Whenever David's interest clashed with Joab's interest, Joab always secured his interest at the cost of the king's interest. And so all the mighty things he did, in truth, they were driven, not for love of David, not for love of God, but for the securing of what was in the best interest of Joab. What did Jesus say? He that must come after me, he must do one thing. He must deny himself and follow me. Joab never did that. Joab would not do that. Take Abner. David said, you know, the wickedness he practiced. He, he cited two examples. When he killed Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa. There was a third man who we'll talk about later on that David didn't mention. But let's start with Abner. Abner was the commander of Saul's, the army of, I mean, armies of Saul throughout the, uh, the time Saul was king. He was an honorable man. He served Saul faithfully. But when Saul died, Abner, because of the power he had, because of the following he had in the army, he could quite easily have taken the kingdom for himself. But he fought and sought to secure it for sons, for, for Saul's sons. So in that sense, he was an honorable man. And David recognized him as an honorable man because remember David even though he had opportunities to kill Saul, he would not do that. He recognized for as long as Saul lived, he was still the king of Israel. And so Abner served him faithfully as he ought to. But in the end, when Abner had a fallen out with Saul's son, he realized, you know what? God has given the kingdom to David. Let's stop all this. And he went and pledged his allegiance, his loyalty to David. God has crowned your king. And David embraced him as a brother in the spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness. Joab wasn't there. When he heard about it, he was angry. And he arranged to have Abner killed. And that's then you see all this in 2 Samuel, um, 2 Samuel chapter 2. He plotted and had Abner killed. In the face of it, he claimed that Abner killed his brother, therefore he was taking vengeance. But in truth, Joab would not countenance a rival authority to his. Joab would not take the risk that David could appoint Abner commander in his stead. And he would not have that. And would not, without consulting the king, he had Abner murdered. He claimed Abner came to spy, came to spy your, our defenses, and he was going to come back. Even if that was the case, wouldn't it, shouldn't it have been enough that the king embraced him as a brother? How dare you go behind the back of the king to have this man murdered? That is lawless. Remember Jesus said, go away from me, you that walk lawlessness. Joab would not submit to any authority that was not to his advantage. He would not recognize the authority of the Lord over him because submission to that authority would mean the denial of something that was in his best interest. In this case, the possibility that he might lose the command of the army Good example of Joab's interest clashing with the king's and the king's interest to hell with it. Mine would prevail. It gets worse. David mentioned Amasa. Amasa was blood was a blood relative. We find we see that in um, in First Chronicles chapter seven. You, you, you read about Amasa. David's so, uh, father, Jesse, he had seven sons, we read, and two daughters. Those two daughters were Zeruiah and then Abigail. Zeruiah was mother of David, uh, sorry, Joab and his two brothers, which is why again and again David will, will refer to them as the sons of Zeruiah. 
But the second daughter, Jesse's second daughter, Abigail, had a son, and that son was Amasa. So Amasa and Jerob are cousins, both of them nephews to David. Jerob had Amasa killed in a very gruesome way. You see this in um, 2 Samuel chapter 20. He had him killed in a very gruesome way. Amasa died, bled to death very slowly. What was Amasa's crime? After Absalom's rebellion, another young man um, by name Sheba raised another rebellion against David. And David said to Amasa, assemble an army, go put down Sheba's rebellion. Notice what happened there. He did not give the task to Joab. He gave it to Amasa. And in Joab's mind, that was unforgivable because there would not be a rival command to his. It didn't matter what the king wanted. That was irrelevant. Amasa threatened Joab's preeminent position. And so he had him killed. In cold blood, embraced him, Amasa, my brother, then stabbed him, says, cut open his stomach, his intestines, just spilled out, and he bled to death by the roadside. Just because he suspected that David was lining somebody up to take over the command of the army, Joab would not have that. It gets worse. There was a third man that David did not mention. Perhaps out of, he was mindful of Solomon's sensitivities. There was Absalom, David's son. Absalom raised a rebellion. Joab was in charge of putting down the rebellion. And David's instruction was very, very clear. You see this in 2 Samuel chapter 18. His instruction to Joab and to the entire army command was very clear. As much as possible, please, I plead with you, I beg you, take the young man alive. Yes, if he was threatening your life and the only option you had was to defend yourself and then strike him down in the process, so be it. But if you can, if you could, take him alive. He remains my son. And all the army, they heard that command. The rebellion was eventually put down. And so the Absalom and his armies, they fled. We know Absalom to be a tall, he's described as tall, with, with long hair. As he was riding away on his mule, his head got cut on a tree branch. And there he was, flaring. His mule bolted from under him. And there he, he was, suspended, flaring helplessly. The first soldier who saw him came to Joab. Absalom, Absalom is um, caught on a tree branch. Joab said, what? And you didn't kill him? I, could, I would have given you 10 shekels of silver in, in, in reward for killing him. And the soldier said something to Joab. Even if you gave me a thousand shekels, I would not have put my hand against Absalom because I heard the instruction the king gave to you and the rest of the army that as much as possible, take the young man alive. Job marched off, came to where Absalom was, saw him suspended, flaring, helpless. And I would imagine several calculations played in his head. Right, the king still loves his son. If he lives, he's likely to succeed to the throne. And if he does so, that's me done. All my wealth, all the zero wire family holdings, not secured. If Absalom lives, my wealth, my place in court, my position, will be in danger. It doesn't matter what the king instructed. I will do here and now what is in my best interest. And so Joab goes, proceeds and just kills him. 
cold blood again. A conscript soldier spoke truth. He said, I heard the instruction of the king. I believe in, in lawfulness. I am someone who is subject to law, who is subject to authority. I am not lawless. But Joab was lawless. But here's how it is also tragic in the context of Joab and in the context of um, Matthew 7. Joab had ample opportunity to learn from David. Joab had 40 years plus to have that nature within him changed by observing the man that David was. They, Joab had the opportunity to, to earn, to attain compatibility with his Lord and with his King, but Joab would not. I said David was a murderer, but David, Joab must have heard David pray, cry, sing Psalm 51. When all of those David Psalms, they were not done in secret. Joab must have heard. David cried, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Joab heard that. When David put on ashes and sackcloth, fasted, cried to God for mercy, had no impact on him. <laughs> Zero effect. First Samuel chapter 24. Joab was there. I'm sure he was, given his place of command. When David flee from Saul, at the cave at Engedi, when, they, when Saul came to the cave to relieve himself, and the men around David said, aha, praise God, God has given you a name into your hand. This is it. Let's finish this fight. Let's kill him. Joab was there, or he heard, or he observed how David said, I would not put forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. I would not go one step ahead of God. I would not take matters into my hand. Much more important to me is, the, is, the, is my obedience to the will of God. Yes, I've been anointed king, but if God says I will only reign for one day, maybe when I'm in my, I will only wait into my into the last year of my life and rent just for one year or for one month that is good enough for me as long as that's what god wants i will not take matters into my hand i will not force it job saw that job was there in um first uh, samuel uh, 26 when again um at the wilderness of ziph David and his men, again, fleeing from Saul, they, they encountered Saul and his army in deep sleep, in deep slumber. And David said, who would go with me to where Saul, uh, to where Saul was lying, uh, was sleeping? And Joab's brother, Abishai, said, I would go, no doubt expecting to be a hero, to be the one who, who finally killed Saul. And they crept, David and Abishai, they crept to where Saul was sleeping. And Abishai said, that's it. This is it. Just permit me. Just one, one blow of the spear, one strike is all that is required. I'm going to pin him to the ground and this fight will be over. David said to Abishai, far be it from me. Far be it. God do so to me and more also if I should so much as put forth my hand to strike the Lord's anointed. 
He said to Abishai, I will wait. God will take care of this matter in his own time. I will not do it for him. I will not put forth my hand against Saul. David, all he did was to cut off a piece of Saul's robe. Even then, it was, it was guilt-stricken for barely living to do that. Abishai saw that, and I'm sure he related that to Joab, how David would not take the Lord to his own hand. I could give example after example. Joab was there when after Saul and Jonathan died, when David would not go up to take the throne said bring me the effort let me let me consult the lord he said lord should i go up and he was prepared to hold back if the lord said do not go up Joab saw all that no effect at all that is why it is tragic if you go back to matthew 7 Say, so not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father. So that, that thing that is so irredeemably disqualifying has a lot to do with a refusal, a persistent refusal not to deny oneself for the Lord. That is so disqualifying. Afterwards, from verse 24, Jesus will go on to say, I liken you to he who hears the word and does it. So this has something to, to do with obedience. And at the heart of it, why would a Christian who, 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 who knows the Lord to the extent that they, they prophesy to the extent that they're able to speak in the name of the Lord and demons will comply. Why would such a Christian be disqualified in the end? Simple. Refusal to deny self for the Lord. It is entirely possible to do many wonderful things. And the motivation, remember the Lord looks at the heart. It looks deep within. It is entirely possible to do so many things for the Lord. Not, well, so many things for, in quotation marks, for the Lord. But in truth, we are doing them for ourselves, for what is in it for us. It is entirely possible to do, to prophesy, to cast out <laughs> demons. We do all that driven by accolades by what's in it for us i don't know i don't know but that's that's that's, that's what is implied there and my prayer all the time is lord give me a, a disposition of of soul that wants to do anything because of what's in it for you as opposed to what's in it for me because the two it's it, they can be blurred sometimes they can be it can become intermingled i'll close with um because of time with a sister margaret e barber i don't know if you're familiar with that name a lot more people are familiar with the name watchman name but for every hundred people who have heard of Watchman Nee, I would, I would imagine only a tiny fraction will have heard of Margaret E. Barber. Margaret Barber was a sister who left this country in 1909 to go to China. She was draped, she, was, she felt called by the Lord. Imagine then a, a lone woman, what she went with her niece, two lone women, two, just with no organized support. But she felt that that's what the Lord was calling her to do, and she went by faith. No organizer. This was at a time when foreign missions had massive organized backing and support. She went and settled in a place called Fuzhou, 
which happens to be the hometown of Watchman Nee. And for many decades, in silent prayer and no fanfare, just praying and ministering to the young people like God brought them in contact, brought, uh, brought, brought to them. That's all she did, quietly, silently. One of those young people happened to be Watchman Nee. But later on, Watchman Nee would testify that his entire, the, the, the whole foundation for his Christian life and understanding was led by Margaret Baba. She died in 1930. In she, she never left China. And when she died, she, in her will, she passed on her earthly belongings to Watchman Nee, which comprised of the belongings, comprised of her Bible and her, her notes. When Watchman Nee got the Bible, um, he opened it. And right on the first page was the motto, the guiding principle that had guided my great Baba's life. And she, had, she wrote there, I want nothing for myself. I want everything for the Lord. If you search that quote online, it will be attributed to watch my name, but it's not his. All he did was he adopted that motto as his, but it was Margaret Baba's. I want nothing for myself. I want everything for the Lord. That was the opposite of who Joab was. That motto is the opposite of what those the many in Matthew 7. That's the life they lived is the very opposite of that declaration. And that it come to a place, a position where we can say, truly, I want nothing for myself. I want everything. For the Lord, the man of God truly means it. I am I am convinced is the man or woman is a brother or sister who is close to saying as Jesus did, the Prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, because if he can truly mean that that I want nothing for myself, then what does the devil have over you? Nothing. If you want nothing for yourself, if you want everything for the Lord, then even your life, it means nothing to you. Paul said, I've lost everything, and I count the loss of everything as nothing that I may win Christ. You know, we read his letters and marvel and revel at them. That came at a price of him wanting nothing for himself, but wanting everything for the Lord. Praise God. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Oh, we thank you for your word. Oh, we thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you that um, we will be those who do the will of the Father, not our will. The ultimate test is when what we want is in, is in opposition to what you want, is in opposition to your will. That, that readiness to, to deny self that your will may, may prevail. Oh, that is, that, is, that is a precious thing. That is the mark of true discipleship. That is the mark of true sonship. That's what Joab could not, would not, did not do. And in the end, the verdict was, I did not know him. Well, may it not be said of us that you never knew us despite calling you Lord, 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 Lord for all our lives. That true knowing is when we put everything on the table, submit, yield to you, that you might come in and have your way. And he will say of us, yes, 
I know you. Amen.